Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, who at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan proclaimed him your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit, grant that all who are baptized into his name may keep the covenant they have made and boldly confess him as Lord and Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God in glory everlasting. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The writer and theologian, the, the Catholic priest, Henry Nouwen, Henry Nouwen tells the story of when he was a professor teaching at Yale Divinity School. A young man named Fred Bratman came to see him. Fred was a journalist, and he had come to interview Nouwen for a piece he was writing, which would appear in the Sunday edition of the New York Times. As we sat down to talk, Nowen said, as we sat down to talk, I quickly found myself taken hold of by a mixture of irritation and fascination. I was irritated because it was clear that this journalist was not terribly interested in doing what he was doing. Someone had suggested to him that I might be a good subject for a profile he had followed up on the suggestion, but I couldn't detect any great eagerness to know me or any ardent desire to write about me. It was a journalist's job that had to be done, but could easily be done without. Nevertheless, Nowen said, there was also an element of fascination because I sensed behind the mask of indifference a spirit fully alive, eager to learn and to create. I somehow knew I was face to face with a man full of great personal gifts, anxiously searching for a way to use them. 
well, it wasn't a very good interview. Now in saying it seemed to be a very little interest to either of them. An article would be written, a few people might read it, and there would be little, if any, outcome. But just as Fred was getting ready to leave, Nowen looked at him and said, tell me, do you like your job? And Fred replied, no, not really, but it's a job. And Nowen responded in a way he thought was most likely naive in retrospect. Nowen said, well, if you don't like it, why do you do it? Well, for the money, of course. But then, without any further prompting from Nowen, Fred added, although I really love to write, doing these little newspaper profiles frustrates me because the limitations of length and form prevent me from doing justice to my subject. I mean, how, for example, can I say anything in depth about you and your ideas when I can only use 750 words to express it? But what choice do I have? You got to make a living. I mean, I should be happy to have at least this to do. But in Fred's voice, now and heard both anger and resignation. It dawned on Nowen that Fred, Fred was close to surrendering his dreams. Nowen said, Fred looked to me like a, a prisoner locked behind the doors of a society forcing him to work at something in which he didn't believe. Beneath the cynicism and the sarcasm, I sensed a beautiful heart, a heart that wanted to give, to create, to live a fruitful life. And Nowen describes looking upon Fred the way Jesus did when he looked upon the rich young ruler. Jesus looked at the rich young ruler and loved him and said, you lack one thing. And Nowen, in a sense, did the same, looking on Fred and loved him and said to him, what do you really want? And Fred replied, I want to write a novel, but I'll never be able to do it. Is this something you really want? Nowen asked. Fred looked at him and said, yes, it is. But I'm also afraid because I've never written a novel and maybe I don't have what it takes to be a novelist. Well, how will you find out, asked Nowen. Well, I probably won't ever be able to find out. You need time, money, and most of all, talent, and I don't have any of that. At that moment, Nowen said, I felt a strong urge to break down all these walls of fear, convention, social expectations, and self-deprecation. And Nowen blurted out, why don't you quit your job and write your novel? I can't, Fred said. And they continued arguing. Nowen kept pressing him. Fred kept resisting until Fred started looking at Nowen with increasing surprise, wondering what it was that had gotten him into this bizarre conversation. Well, Fred said, I'd better go. Maybe one day I will write my novel. Wait, Nowen said. I meant what I said. Follow your desire. And with more than a touch of sarcasm in his voice, Fred said, sounds good to me. Now, for Nowen, Nowen believed that people can make choices and make them according to their own best aspirations. But he also believed that people seldom make these choices. Instead, Nowen said, they blame the world, society, and others for their fate and waste much of their life complaining. But Nowen continued to think that Fred was different, that Fred could take the leap, as it were. But first, Nowen had to leap. And so he said to Fred, Fred, give up your job. Come here for a year and write your novel. I will get the money somehow. 
Now, hearing this made Fred very nervous, I mean, who began to wonder what was motivating all this. I mean, what does this man really want from me, Fred thought. Why is he offering me time and money to write? I don't trust this. There must be something else going on here. But despite his initial suspicions, a few months later, Fred came to Yale Divinity School and spent a year trying to write his novel. It was never written. He never finished it. But neither Fred nor Nowen considered this a failure due to the friendship that developed between them. And over the following years, Nowen discovered just how different their lives were. And through Fred, Nowen discovered that the life that Fred lived that was so different from his Fred's life wasn't that different from so many others. There was a lot of Fred's out there. Fred was a secular Jew, skeptical of religion, but nonetheless yearning for something deeper. And one day, while they were walking down Columbus Avenue in New York City, Fred turned to Nowen and said, why don't you write something about the spiritual life for me and my friends. Can you speak to people like me who are wondering what life is all about? What would you say to us? Fred's question became much more than the intriguing suggestion of a young New York intellectual, said Nowen. It became the plea that arose on all sides, wherever I was open to hear it. And in the end, Nowen said, in the end, it became for me the most pertinent and the most urgent of all demands, a demand which said, speak to us about the deepest yearnings of our hearts, about our many wishes, about hope. Not about the the many strategies for survival, but about trust. Not about new methods of satisfying our emotional needs, but about love. Speak to us about a vision larger than our changing perspectives and about a voice deeper than the clamorings of our mass media. Yes, speak to us about something or someone greater than ourselves. Speak to us about God. And so he did. Nowen decided to write a book to Fred, as if he was writing directly to Fred, in hopes that all the other Freds out there would also see it as written to them. And this is how Nowen started that book. Ever since you asked me to write for you and your friends about the spiritual life, I have been wondering if there might be one word I would most want you to remember when you finished reading all I wish to say. And that special word has gradually emerged from the depths of my own heart. It is the word beloved. Beloved. And I am convinced it has been given to me for the sake of you and your friends. Being a Christian, I first learned this word from the story of the baptism of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Fred, now wrote, our many conversations led me to the inner conviction that the words, you are the beloved, revealed the most intimate truth about human beings. All I want to say to you is, you are the beloved. And all I hope 
is that you can hear these words as spoken to you with all the tenderness and force that love can hold. My only desire is to make these words reverberate in every corner of your being. You are the beloved. I want you to hear the voice that says that to you. But it certainly is not easy to hear that voice in a world filled with voices that shout, you are no good, you are ugly, you are worthless, you are despicable, you are nobody. These negative voices are so loud and persistent, now and wrote, they are so loud and persistent that it is easy to believe them. That's the great trap. It is the trap of self-rejection. Over the years, I have come to realize that the greatest trap in our life is not success, popularity, or power, but self-rejection. Success, popularity, and power can indeed present a great temptation, but their seductive quality often comes from the way they are a part of the much larger temptation to self-rejection. When we have come to believe in the voices that call us worthless and unlovable, then success, popularity, and power are easily perceived as attractive solutions. The real trap, however, is self-rejection. Now and wrote, I am constantly surprised at how quickly I give in to this temptation. As soon as someone accuses me or, or criticizes me, as soon as I am rejected, left alone, or abandoned, I find myself thinking, well, that proves once again that I am a nobody. Instead of taking a, a critical look at the circumstances or trying to, to understand my own and others' limitations, I tend to blame myself, not just for what I did, but for who I am. My dark side says, I am no good. I deserve to be pushed aside, forgotten, rejected, abandoned. Or maybe that's not your problem at all. Maybe you are more tempted by arrogance than self-rejection. But, now and said, isn't arrogance, in fact, the other side of self-rejection? Isn't arrogance putting yourself on a pedestal to avoid being seen as you see yourself? Isn't arrogance, in the final analysis, just another way of dealing with the feelings of worthlessness? Both self-rejection and arrogance pull us out of the common reality of existence and make a gentle community of people extremely difficult, if not impossible, to attain. I know too well, Nowen said, I know too well that beneath my arrogance there lies much self-doubt, just as there is a great amount of pride hidden in my self-rejection. Whether I am inflated or deflated, I lose touch with the truth and distort my vision of reality. Self-rejection is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice that calls us the beloved. Being the beloved expresses the core truth of our existence. Being the beloved expresses the core truth of our existence. And the soft, gentle voice that speaks those words, you are the beloved, that voice speaks those words deep in your heart. Even when those words remain unheard by you or unconvincing to you. The one who speaks them never stops speaking them. You are the beloved. You are not what others or even you 
think about yourself. You are not what you do. You are not what you have. You are, says Nowen, you are a full member of the human family, having been known before you were conceived and molded in your mother's womb. In times when you feel bad about yourself, try to choose to remain true to the truth of who you truly are. Look in the mirror each day and claim your true identity. I am the beloved. Act ahead of your feelings and trust that one day your feelings will match your convictions. Choose now and continue to choose this incredible truth. As a spiritual practice, claim and reclaim your primal identity as beloved daughter or son of an unconditionally loving God. Do that today. Do it every day. I am the beloved. We're working on spiritual practices such as this during the Epiphany season as together we work through James Bryan Smith's The Good and Beautiful God. Some groups started this past week, others start this week, so it's not too late to join in. To start practicing, practicing listening, to listen to that voice that is so hard to hear, and start becoming what you already are. To hear the voice that says, I have called you from all eternity. I have loved you from all eternity. And I love you not because you do good things, not because you have a lot of things, not because people speak well about you, not because you're so exciting or have so many talents. I love you because I love you. Because I love you. You are the beloved. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things remain. 
for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Through Christ, we are anointed with the Holy Spirit in baptism. May the same Spirit inspire us as we offer our prayers, responding, Hear us, God of glory. For an overflowing gift of generosity, that we may reflect God's abundant care for all of creation, lifting others out of systemic poverty increasing the mission work of our churches, and reaping the joy of a philanthropic life. Let us pray. Hear us, God of glory. For the courage to walk through the tranquil and the turbulent waters of life, knowing that in our baptism, we died with Christ in darkness and joined him in the risen light. Let us pray. Hear us. God of glory. For Joseph Biden, our president, and all who exercise authority in the nations of the world, that they will faithfully establish justice on earth and carry the torch of freedom and peace into all their deliberations. Let us pray. Hear us, God of glory. For the church, that it may bear witness to Jesus' forgiveness and love, offering to those outside its walls the light that illumines all darkness and releases humanity from the grip of sin. Let us pray. Hear us, God of glory. That we may know our identity through the voice of God, who claims us as his beloved children and invites us to share in his earthly mission. Let us pray. Hear us, God of glory. In thanksgiving for the body and blood of Christ, a foretaste of that heavenly banquet upon which the faithful departed continually feast. Let us pray. Hear us, God of glory. in companionship with the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints whose constant intercession strengthens our faith, let us continue our prayers. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, you have made us one with your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage we may always be supported by this fellowship of love and prayer, and know ourselves to be surrounded by their witness to your power and mercy. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom all our intercessions are acceptable through the Spirit, and who lives and reigns forever and ever. 
Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, bring you unto everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace, everybody. Peace, peace. Peace. Peace to all the folks here in the nave. Peace to the folks in the transept. Peace to anyone that might happen to be in the Preston Cutler room. I doubt there's anyone outside, but peace to you if there is. And peace to all you folks who are worshiping with us online. But wherever you happen to find yourself, please be seated. So good morning. Welcome to Christ Church. Uh, so you missed it this morning if you weren't there at 9.15 uh, as we have uh, restarted for the new year our uh, uh, formation hour for adults, children, and youth. Um, and uh, adults meet over in the parish hall and today was an update uh, from the campus uh, task force. Um, so, uh, it, and you missed it, you missed it. But uh, it was recorded and it's on Facebook. So uh, Facebook archives everything. So go to our Christ Church page and make sure you check out uh, the update uh, from the campus task force, uh, which as you uh, may know, they have been tasked with uh, helping us uh, with uh, <laughs> spending the money from the capital campaign, I guess you could say. And, uh, and I'm delighted that uh, at least the last time I checked, um, you, we had a goal of $600,000, a stretch goal of $750,000. And last time I checked, which was a, a few days ago, we were at $830,000, so we're even past our stretch goal. So that is definitely something uh, to, to celebrate and uh, to give thanks to God for. So, and thank you for all your, your generosity. Um, so next week, it's not the campus task force, but it's Dean Boardman, and for three weeks for Dean Boardman at Adult Formation. So you, you know you wanna come early, because you know it's gonna be good and inter interesting, and there's gonna be discussion. So that's at 9.15 uh, over in the parish hall, starting next Sunday with Father Dean. Um, as I mentioned in my sermon, uh, we are in the midst of kicking off our various uh, groups uh, for the book study of uh, James Bryan Smith's The Good and Beautiful God. Uh, the group that I'm facilitating started on Thursday night. I know Mother Susan's group on Zoom starts tomorrow night. Um, uh, so there, there are groups, and, and there's room, there's lots of room. So we hope that you'll let me know if you want to participate in one of these groups, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, tell, tell whoever's facilitating that you want to be part of the group. Um, I did hear from someone, though, this week that evenings just don't work for this person. Uh, and that's the only person I've heard that evenings don't work. 
but if there's one person that evenings don't work for, maybe there's others. Uh, so let me know because we can still form a group or two even uh, for people based on what their availability are, uh, is. So uh, currently, you know, we have uh, the group on Thursday night in person in the parish hall, the group on Thursday night on Zoom, and the group on Monday night on Zoom. And, you know, they're just starting off. You're not missing. Uh, the first chapter was great, uh, but you can catch up. There's still, there's still good opportunity for you to do this. You can make it your New Year's resolution. But as I said before, and Jim, James Bryan Smith says, New Year's resolutions, 95% of them are broken by the end of January. However, if you take on a New Year's resolution with someone else, so if you do some, the same thing with someone else, you have a 90% success rate of continuing that New Year's resolution. If you do it by yourself, you have a 5% chance of doing it. If you do it with someone else, you have a 90% chance of continuing it. One person makes 85% difference as to whether you succeed or fail. And so that's what these groups are for. We hope that you'll read this book on your own, but we really, really hope you'll participate because chances of you internalizing this and making it part your own uh, so it reverberates throughout your body, just as Henry Nowen was saying, um, it increases dramatically if you do this with others who are trying to do the same thing. So please consider joining a group. Have I said would you, that I'd like you to join a group? I think I've said that all the last five minutes. So just join a group and let me know if you can't do the groups because we'll find a group. We'll make, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. We'll make it work. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. And gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it, for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. 
and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. We do not presume to come to this, your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.